Amen. All right, there in Jude chapter 1, look at verse number 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Look at what he says here. He says the common salvation. He's saying it's necessary for us to contend for the faith. He's saying salvation is a common thing. There's What salvation is, is something that we should fight for. Is what he's saying right here. What is the common salvation? First, we see that it's faith. He says earnestly contend for the faith. We know that salvation is faith alone. In Titus 1, he says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. An important aspect of this is that the Son of God is our Savior. What I just quoted you in Titus chapter 1, it says, From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. But look back at verse number 1. At the tail end of it there, it says, To them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Our soul is sealed unto the day of redemption because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. You cannot separate the Son and the Father. You can't omit the Son. And there's a lot of bad doctrine these days, especially as we move closer and closer to the end times. There will be a one world order, a one world government, a one world religion. That one world religion will teach one God. They will deny the Trinity. They will say, we, are, we all have God in us. We can all become a God. They'll, they'll, everyone will have a path that ultimately leads to the oneness of God. Oneness is a New Age concept. Yeah. We see a distinction between the Father and the Son right here in these verses. And we're going to talk about the, the common salvation tonight, this aspect of Jude. It says that we should earnestly contend for the faith. Look at verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. There are people going into churches all across America probably right now that don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in the common salvation. And we're always going to have to fight this fight. Now, you know, There are traitors that, that would pervert the Gospel of Christ. They would preach another Gospel. The Bible says, let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And the rest of that verse there in Jude, he says that they, he says, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The men that creep in to do this, they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do it with subtlety. They do it with deception. And they do it because of their own ungodly lust. There's always going to be someone trying to pervert the Gospel. There's always going to be a fight, whether it's a Mormon or a Calvinist or they don't believe in the Trinity or they think you have to work your way to heaven. There's always going to be a fight against the common salvation. We have to contend against it. We have to stand up for the truth. Yep. And listen, my first point is this, as you're in John chapter 1, faith in the Son of God is required for salvation. Amen. Faith in the Son. If you don't have faith in the Son of God, you're not saved. Look at verse number 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Listen, the Word is the Creator here. They're saying the Word is the one that made everything. So what's, what's the name of the Word? What's another name for the Word? Now look, I'm going to fill you in on something. Brother Joe was telling me about this earlier, about somebody that literally denying this and, and the deception behind it. And they, oh, no, no, it's not the Son of God. It's just the Word. But if you take the verses in context that teach about the Word of God, it always cross-references to Jesus, the Son of God, the Creator, and the Savior. These points are driven home. Jesus has many names or many titles. And to blur the lines of salvation, to confuse something that's common and should be understood by everybody by, by, by narrowing in on one title and ignoring another, is deception. That's right. It's evil. It's wicked. Look at verse 29 in this chapter. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, 
Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, names we've looked at so far in this chapter were the Word, Jesus, right? The Lamb of God. There's two names we skipped to get here to verse 29. One is the only begotten Son in the Christ. But look at verse 32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode on Him. Right? There's the Holy Ghost. Verse 3, 33. And I knew Him not, but He that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on Him, the same is He which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist was sent by the Father. The Father revealed to John the Baptist that whoever he sees the, the Holy Ghost coming and descending on is the Christ, it is the Messiah, it is the Savior, it's the Son of God, it's Him that will baptize with the Holy Spirit. This is what's being taught here. Look at verse 34. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. You hear that? This is the Son of God. So Jesus, the Word, in context, is the Son of God. Those that would deny that are denying this passage in context. Amen. Now turn to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to come back to John in a second. But turn to 1 John chapter 5. There are many names for, the, for, the God, for God the Son. Jesus being the most popular. The Son of God probably being the second most popular. And faith in the Son of God for salvation is commonly taught throughout the entire Bible. This is not something that you can easily twist without denying a bunch of Scripture. And here we see that John bare record, right? He gave witness that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior. He was the Son of God sent by the Father. He bare witness that Jesus was sent by the Father and He Himself was sent by the Father. They were both sent by the Father. You're in 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So, who has not overcome the world? Those that deny that Jesus is the Son of God. That's right. Look at verse 6. This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Here's the famous verse, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now why is oneness wrong? Because they would say, well there's one, and He's sometimes sort of three. Right, But that's the opposite of what this says. He says there are three and they are one. Now, when it says that they bear record, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, according to John chapter 1, what we just looked at, what's the name of the Word? Jesus Christ. What's a title for Jesus Christ? That's right, the Son of God. Look at the next verse, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one. Hey, there is a separate will for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but their will agrees. They're not in contrast. They're not in competition. It is one God. But they are all three, yet God. Look at verse number 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which He hath testified of His Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. If you don't believe in the Son of God, you're calling the Father a liar. Plain and simple. There's no way around it. And these Trinity deniers that are out here believing that the Son of God is not eternal, or He's not really from everlasting, or that Jesus Christ was created at some point, the Son of God was created at some point in history, they are unsaved fools. This is total heresy, yeah. and this is out of their mouth, word for word, what they believe. Right. But does it agree with the Bible? No. no, it does not. No, it does not. Look at verse 11. 
And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Amen. The Word is the Son. It says it in this chapter also. So whether you're in 1 John 1 talking about the Word, or you're in, I'm sorry, in John 1, or in 1 John 5 talking about the Word, He's also called the Son. Yep. And here, salvation is clearly those that believe the record. They agree with that record that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you don't believe that record, according to this verse, you don't have eternal life. Yeah, that's right. Plain and simple. You don't have the, the witness inside of you. You don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you if you say the Son of God is not from everlasting. You are not saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit if you would say that the Son of God was created at some point. Because listen, the Son of God is the Creator. Look at verse number 12. He that hath the Son... Wait, did we, read, did we read 11? Let's back up. Let's read 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. And again, there's this new age, one world religion, one world God, oneness junk that's going to be infecting every aspect of religion, but not here. Not this church. Amen. Not this. Not because the Bible is clear on it. Look at verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have the Son of God, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He's your Savior and Creator, then you do not have eternal life. That's right. Plain and simple. Now look, this oneness heresy that Jesus was created, that Jesus received eternal life for a period, what these Pentecostals teach is that Jesus received eternal life. He had it for three and a half years and that the rest of the time it was just man. Well, if, if a man was born of a virgin and if a man died for my sins, then I'm still in sin. I, it has to be God. It has to be a spotless sacrifice. They're denying the power of God. They're denying the common salvation. Look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God's redundant sometimes. He wants us to get this in our head. We have to believe on the name of the Son of God to have eternal life. Now turn to John chapter 3. Without that, without the Son of God, you have no eternal life. You are unsaved. It couldn't be any clearer in the Scriptures. But again, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, then this wasn't even written to you. You can't even open up John 5. It was written to those that believe in the name of the Son of God. And that name is Jesus Christ. The Son from the beginning. From before the beginning. Hey, He created time itself. That's right. Look at John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but He that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. That's a great proof verse that Jesus is God. He's standing there telling them, oh, and by the way, I'm in heaven. Well, how's that work? Don't blur the lines and say, well, He must really be the Father. That's not what He's teaching here. Look at verse 16. Everybody knows this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The most famous verse in the entire world says if you don't believe in the Son, you don't have everlasting life. Does that explain why there's an agenda to attack the Son of God? Yeah. To attack the Deity, the Godhead, the Trinity? To try to make it confusing? To try to cause you to doubt? Well, yeah, there is this one verse that I don't quite... It's kind of mysterious. How about this one real clear verse yeah. that all of you have memorized? The Son of God. You can't be saved without the Son of God. Look at verse 17. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Listen, the Father is not the Savior. The Son is our Savior. The Son saves us from our sin. The Son of God, as He walked the earth, He brought the dead back to life. He forgave sins. If you're not God, you can't forgive sins. If you're not the Son of God, you can't forgive sins. Only Jesus can do that. Verse 18. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you reject the Son of God, you are not saved. If you 
If you believe that the Son has not always existed, you are not saved. You are denying the record. You're calling the Bible a lie. If you teach that He was created as a man and then became God at some point, that is total heresy. Yeah. That is wicked New Age heresy. Right. And it will stay out of this church. Amen. Look at verse 34 in this chapter. John 3, 34. For He whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto Him. Hey, there's a great Trinity verse. you got all three aspects. Look in the next verse. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into His hand. The, look, the Father doesn't love Himself. The Father loves the Son. Just as you parents in here, you love your children. And the goal is to get your children to love you back, right? Hey, quit being a jerk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> look, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into His hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Without believing in the Son of God, you have God's wrath on you. You have condemnation resting on your soul. You have to deal with that. If you believe that, you need to repent of rejecting the Son of God. Yes. And you need to believe the record. You need to believe the Gospel. That's right. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Listen, there has been a separation in the Godhead throughout all time. Hey, even before time. Before time was, there was a separation. You see it in Genesis 1, clear as day. You see it in the end in, in Revelation, clear as day. So why would people twist this? Look at John 4.22. Talking to the woman there, he says, You worship, ye know not what? But we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And what he's saying is, we have the oracles of God. We know the record of God. We know what we're talking about. And he says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. Now how does she know this? She must have the Scriptures as well. Yeah. She must have heard of the Scriptures. And what I find interesting, in Daniel 3.25, it talks about the Son of God. Yeah. Right in the fire with them. But in Daniel 9.25, it tells them of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The Son of God was foretold in so many places in the Bible. It's in Psalms. It's in Proverbs. It's in Daniel. It's in Genesis. And to reject it, you're throwing out so much Scripture. Look at verse 26 here. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. He's saying that Messiah you're talking about, you're looking at Him. Right? Yeah. Now up to this point, we've seen all these names for Jesus. And here He's saying, hey, Messiah. He'll take that title too. Because He is the Christ. Amen. Look at verse 42 in this chapter. And He said unto the woman, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard Him ourselves, and know that this indeed is, this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Christ. He is our Savior. Go to John 5. John chapter 5. The Father sent the Son of God to be our Savior. That's an important thing we have to remember. John 5.15 The men departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made Him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay Him because He had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill Him, because He not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was His Father, making Himself equal with God. When He said, that's My Father, they're saying, whoa, you're claiming to be the Son of God? Whoa, you're claiming to be the Savior? They knew what that title meant. How come a bunch of bozos that want to be Pentecostals can't figure this out? Because they need to read their Bible. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you, then you don't understand what's being taught. He made Himself equal with God. Hey, being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Yeah. Turn to John 17. 
John chapter 17. Now listen, the Son of God has always existed. Right? This is the chink in their armor. There are many things that they're being vague. They're being deceptive about. They're not really telling you the truth. They're not talking about spirit and truth here. They're being deceptive and not really telling you what they believe. And here's what they're dancing around. That the Son of God has not always existed. This is what they teach. Now, for Jesus to be the Creator, that would be a direct contradiction. Right? right? We've already seen if you don't have the Son of God, you're not saved. And of course, they might say, oh, we believe in, you know, He was the Son of God for what, three and a half years? What are they going to come up with next? This is what the oneness Pentecostal Muslims, and they all believe the same thing, that Jesus has not existed from everlasting as the Bible teaches. And, you know, the Son of God has existed forever, but oneness modalism has not. Okay? Look, you're in John 17. Actually, look at verse number 4. It says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had, which the which I had with thee before the world was. So here you see a distinction. They're talking about the glory. He finished the work, and he's saying that he did it before the world was. Look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Now if Jesus was a created being, or if Jesus was a man that ascended into Godhood at some point, that became God later in life, then how is it that the Father has loved Him from before the foundation of the world. Before the first day, before Genesis 1-1, there was love. They loved each other. They're, they're working together. How could that even be possible? It's not. It's utter confusion. Now look, I want you to go to Colossians chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple verses back and forth that are parallels in these two chapters. Colossians chapter 1, in Hebrews chapter 1. Get your finger in both places. You can lose your place in John. In Revelation it says that Jesus he is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right? Before the world was founded, Jesus knew He would have to be that sacrificial Lamb. The Father knew He would have to send His Son to die for our sins. The Son of God as our Savior, He has always been. This is not a temporary role. This is not He puts on a mask or He was for a little while. He always has been. Amen. In 1 Peter 1, he says, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. From the beginning, before the beginning, He was there. Before this world, before time itself, He was there. And you can't deny that according to the Scriptures. If you do, you're denying the record of the Son of God. Even you know, and, and listen, the Son of God is the Creator. The Son of God is our Creator. Jesus created everything. You know, Genesis, let us make man in our image, right? The let us. Hey, who was creating? God. Well, who? God, who? The Son of God, more specifically. Jesus, the Son of God, made time. He made the clock before it started, and He is not stuck in time. He didn't just show up for three years. He's not going to end at a certain time. He will always be even when time ceases to exist. And you know, He created days and years. To say that Jesus is stuck in a three and a half year period of actually being the Son of God just totally denies the Godhead. Rejecting the Son and the Godhead is rejecting the record that God has given us. Now you're in Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1. Start in Colossians 1. Look at verse number 12 giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So first of all, what you see, there's forgiveness of sins comes through the Son of God. Second, I want you to see that there's this separation. Hey, the Father... And then it talks about the Son. But then it talks about the Son's kingdom. 
It's the Son that has the kingdom. Now go to Hebrews 1. Verse number 8. But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. So here in this verse, you have that same distinction. The Father is telling the Son, Hey God, Your kingdom's going to be forever. So God is telling God, Your kingdom's going to be forever. God the Father is telling God the Son, Your kingdom will be forever. Now look at the next point. Hebrews 1 verse 3. Take a step back. Who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power when He had Himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now turn back to Colossians 1. So it says He's the express image of His person. Notice it says He sat down. So there's more than the throne issue as a whole. That's, that's like a straw man argument, if you will. Colossians 1, as you're turning there, you know, in Colossians 2, he says, For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the Son of God looks like the Father. It's what it's saying. My daughter, God help her, looks like me. The poor child. There's hope. Maybe she'll grow out of it. Every time we go to the store, people, oh, she looks like Daddy. I'm like, why would you say such a terrible thing about that poor girl? It's obvious. She is in the image of me. She looks like me. How is this difficult to understand that Jesus, as the Son of God, has the express image of the Father. You're in Colossians 1, look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So we see it again, that He has he dwelt in the fullness of the bodily, right? But we see the image mentioned twice here. Now look at verse 16. For by Him, this is the Son of God, for by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. If Jesus was created Himself, this verse would be a contradiction. If the Son of God did not exist in all time, this verse would be a contradiction. The Bible does not contradict itself. right? These oneness fools, they contradict the Bible. They go against the Bible because they've rejected the record of the Son of God. They don't have the witness in themselves. They're not saved. They don't have eternal life. Go back to Hebrews 1. Verse number 10. And Thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of Thine hands. The heavens are the works of Thine hands, He's saying. Who made the heavens? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Look at verse 12. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, in whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Jesus made the worlds. Maybe that's verse 2. Verse 2. Thank you. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Who made the worlds? Jesus, the Son of God. Now go back to go back to Jude. Go back to the book of Jude. So Jesus, the eternal Son of God, created all things, including time itself. He was not created. The Son is not the Father. He is our Savior. And He will return to judge the earth. And to take away from the Father, or to take away from the Son of God, by trying to teach that the Son is really the Father, makes no sense. You can't have a Father if there's no Son, if there's no children. You can't have a Son if there's no Father. It's a no-brainer. That's why we have the virgin birth. This is something that's also essential to the common salvation. Understanding that it's the power of God that saves. It's not by the will of man. It's not that just something that men made up. It's not, you know, it's not hearsay. The Bible is true and salvation is found in the Son of God. Now look at verse 17. Jude 1, 17. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. What words? What did the apostles teach us? Right? That we're saved by faith alone. That Jesus 
is the Son of God and He's God the Son. And whether or not that term is in the Bible, it is biblical. There are dozens of verses that prove that Jesus is God. And you can't just ignore those by saying He's really the Father because then you throw out the hundreds of verses that teach that Jesus is the Son of God. All, all of your salvation verses, as you give the Gospel, think about it. How many times you're going to hit the Son of God? Believe on the Son of God. Believe that He sent His Son, the only begotten Son. It would make no sense to take the Son away and say He just existed temporarily. He was a temporary Son. He wasn't really God from the beginning. It wasn't really a virgin birth. I mean, how do you, how do, you do all this? How do you come up with this? I believe the Lord has to confound you to believe this foolishness. And He Himself would encourage people, well, go watch this debate between James White and a Pentecostal. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a lot of wisdom there. A lot of wisdom. Yeah, from two unsaved people who are going to argue about the nature of God. What in the world? I mean, go put your head in the sand. You'll learn more about God. <laughs> what a bunch of idiots. Look at verse number 18 here. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we know the common salvation, right? Faith alone. Salvation is faith alone. Sin was forgiven by who? The Son of God. By Jesus Christ. Here it says, looking for mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't deserve it. It's a free gift. And it's through Jesus Christ alone. So what do we do with this information? Now that we have it, now that we know what the common salvation is, what do we do? We go soul winning, right? Yeah. Look what he says. And if some have compassion making a difference. Show them some love. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We are to scare the hell out of some people. And if you reject that the Son of God is biblical, if you say the Son of God is not my Savior, the Son of God was created, there really is no Trinity, it's not the Father and the Son, you are rejecting one of the foundational points of the common salvation. And if you know somebody that's in that category, save with fear. Scare the hell out of them. Tell them that they're on their way to hell because they've rejected the Son of God. And we, we diminish that term because we focus on the fact that Jesus is God, but Jesus made that a highlight. In the Word, the Word itself wants us to know that He's the Son of God that's been around forever. He's our Savior and our Creator. And if you deny that, you don't have the witness. You don't believe the record. You don't have eternal life. So what do we do? We preach Christ crucified to the glory of God the Father. We tell people what He did for us. We save the lost because the world is preaching a gospel that cannot save. Every other religion or Christian or not Christian religion is saying something that will not save them. And it, mainly, they don't have the Son of God. Or they're trying to work their way to heaven as if the Son of God was not enough. Yeah. And that would make sense if you say, well, He was really a man. And he sort of took the role as an ascended master. He became God for a little while. And then God left him as he before he died on the cross because God can't die. Well, that's a bunch of foolishness. God laid His life down for our sins because He loves us. And that their gospel cannot save. Look at verse 24. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. Consider this. It's joyous for Jesus when we obey Him. Uh -huh. We need to present ourselves faultless before Him and the Father. Yeah. We need to strive for holiness, rejecting the sin that's causing us to stumble in our life. Being active in that battle. The battle isn't just for souls. Do you want to get better, better in that battle? Then get better in the battle in your own life. That's with good. your own mind, your own flesh, your own eyes, your own mouth. Get active in that battle. Present yourself faultless before God. When you mess up, come before God. Lord, I did it again. I'm back again, Lord. I did it again. He'll forgive you. He'll forgive you and He'll help you. But it's your willingness and how quickly you want to deal with that sin that determines how strong of a soul winner you are for Christ. And if you want to be better at saving the lost, then get better at getting the sin out of your life. Yes, Verse 25, To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty 
dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is God. He is our Savior. He is the Son of God. And if anybody rejects that, you need to show them the Scriptures and try to get them saved. And those that are actively fighting against this doctrine are working for the devil. That's right. We will stand on the truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for just the awesome things we get to learn on this roller coaster as this church, Lord, as, as we have big days and little days. And Lord, I just pray that You would bless everything that's happening this weekend and also with the Mega Marathon coming up. Lord, I ask that You would give us wisdom and either open the door or close the door with this building. Lord, if it's meant to be, we know You will provide for it. We trust You and You alone. We thank You, Jesus. Amen. Amen.